This VW EcoUp is currently the world's most fuel-efficient natural gas-powered car. And natural gas is more environmentally sound than the classic fossil fuels anyway. And in Germany, at least, it's cheaper, too. The alternative engine technology does not mean much adjustment for the driver. Fuel is tanked the same way, even if the tank opening and nozzle are a bit different. A full 11 kilo charge of natural gas gives the EcoUp a 380 kilometer range. But the car also has a 10 liter gasoline tank as a reserve, which the maker says extends that range by a further 220 kilometers. Car tester Chris Kestius says the car has wonderful handling, almost no different from a gasoline powered car. The ecological model doesn't go in for visual extravaganzas. The EcoUp is available in a two-door and a four-door version. But the EcoUp has a recognizable rear, and we can breathe a sigh of relief about the trunk volume. Chris notes that unlike with many other natural gas-powered cars, the EcoUp's large fuel tanks are under the car, not in the trunk. Under the small hood is an all-new 1-liter 50-kilowatt motor with a maximum of 90 newton-meters of torque. But specially trained mechanics are needed when work has to be done on the motor. Volkswagen says the EcoUp burns only 2.9 kilograms of natural gas per 100 kilometers, the equivalent of 4.4 liters of gasoline. So the fuel needed to cover 100 kilometers costs only a little more than 3 euros. That's 50% less than a comparable gasoline-powered car. The alternative fuel system has now arrived on the racetrack too. This Scirocco R-Cup has 173 kilowatts of power and a maximum torque of 275 newton meters. In a race car, it doesn't matter that the fuel tanks take up much of the back seat. Volkswagen began working on natural gas engines in the 1990s. Initially, they were an add-on, but today the Caddy, the Touran, and the Passat are all available as natural gas cars direct from the factory. And now there are technologies to turn natural gas into a liquid, making it easier to transport large quantities of it. As we live in, uh Tim Kaler, CEO of a company that promotes natural gas, says the trend is booming all over the world. 15 million such cars are already in use, and they are a low-priced way of keeping the air clean. If nothing is done to lower emissions, the megacities will suffocate in smog. One of the greatest advantages of natural gas cars is that they can also run on biogas, methane, one from vegetable waste matter. When biogas is burned, the amount of CO2 released is exactly what the plants remove from the air when growing. In biogas methane generators produce artificial natural gas by letting biomass from waste decay, explains Mr. Kaler. The resulting gas is purified and fed into the natural gas pipeline network that supplies natural gas filling stations. He says natural gas thus produced reduces CO2 emissions by more than 80 percent. Natural gas mobility is almost emissions free. The EcoUp costs 13,000 euros in Germany. According to our car testers' calculations, a natural gas car has a price tag 2,500 euros higher than a gasoline-powered vehicle. But with fuel only 3 euros per 100 kilometers, the difference is covered after about 40,000 kilometers. In the fall, Volkswagen will expand its selection of natural gas-powered cars with a version of the new Golf. The 3 Series is BMW's best-selling model. 
A few months ago, the car maker unveiled the wagon version for the sixth generation, introducing the 328i Touring. But unlike with earlier models, don't assume you'll get a 2.8 liter inline six engine. This, says Matis, is evidence of downsizing a BMW. This version has four cylinders and turbo. The displacement is just two liters, although it does deliver 180 kilowatts. It makes the dash to 100 kilometers per hour in six seconds flat. Top speed is capped at 250 kilometers per hour. Official fuel consumption is 6.5 liters for 100 kilometers. The exterior design is classic BMW with a protruding hood and a mean looking face. The headlights now flow into the signature kidney grille. Overall, the new Touring makes a far sportier impression. It's had its weight cut by 40 kilos. The side on profile reveals bold contours stretching from the front fenders to the rear. The five centimeters added to the wheelbase give the new model a total length of 4.62 meters. The rear boasts new LED lights, and the cargo capacity has been increased by 115 liters to 1,500. The automatic trunk operation is standard, of course. Another nice feature is the rear window opening separately. The interior of the new 328i wagon is identical to that of the sedan edition. And the wagon can likewise be ordered with one of three equipment lines, sport, luxury, and modern. The dial in the center console allows you to alter the suspension settings. The red stitching on the black leather adds to the dynamic feel. And on the electronic side, BMW offers an exciting array of entertainment and information options. A nice gimmick seen in various BMW models, says Matas, is Connected Drive, included in the multimedia system. It relays all kinds of information. It's far safer, of course, to pull over in order to operate it properly. Im Stehen ist es nämlich viel sicherer zu bedienen als während der Fahrt. So, dann haben wir hier zum Beispiel Connected Drive gives you access to the internet and can call for breakdown assistance. BMW Online provides you with news, the weather, and internet search options. Google Suche und so weiter und so fort anschauen. Gucken wir mal News, was es so Neues gibt in der Welt. Matas checks out the latest sports news. Defensive changes to the German soccer team ahead of the upcoming match against Holland. And you can get the computer to read it all out to you. It doesn't exactly sound like professional anchor style, but it's a good start in Matus' eyes. You can have the information read out to you while driving, while your eyes are on the road. His tip, however, is play it safe and pull over to listen to the news. So does the 328i wagon ultimately deliver? Matas always finds it tough sitting in a car that has no drawbacks, like the BMW 3 Series sports wagon. He has practically no quibbles with the car. The dimensions and joints are all right on, and the materials are flawless. There's nothing about this car you can complain about. In Germany, our test model costs some 41,000 euros. The smallest diesel version sells for just over 32,000. Spring can't come soon enough for those interested in Audi's new RS5 convertible. The high revving 4.2 liter V8 engine rated at 331 kilowatts takes this high performance model from 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in 4.9 seconds. 
The luxury convertible starts at a list price of 88,500 euros in Germany. Rolls-Royce and BMW are celebrating the quintessentially British luxury car's 10th anniversary as a BMW subsidiary. In that time, the workforce has grown from 400 to 1400, and productivity has increased sixfold. A total of 20 phantoms and ghosts roll off the line every day. Empty. Drivers used to pack along an emergency fuel canister. I'm walking, here's the knee and I'm talking. Right. Today, cars warn you when you're running low. But how reliable are range indicators? We put them to the test. We did our testing on a one kilometer circular track at an airfield to avoid blocking traffic. And here are our test cars. A Golf 6, a BMW 5 Series, and a Hyundai iX35. Before the actual test, the cars have to get acquainted with our driving style, so each car is taken for a 50-kilometer sample drive. Ben Lenson of the Technical University of Darmstadt says a sample is a vital basis for an estimate. The range indicator orients itself toward past driving behavior, he says. That's what it uses to predict future consumption. So let's begin our test with the goal. We'll drive right down to the last drop. The range indicator says zero kilometers. Car tester Daniel Guldner wonders how much leeway is built in. The Golf, supposedly out of gas, continues around the track for another 20 minutes before it comes to a halt. That's it, says Daniel. We've driven 20.1 kilometers farther than the range indicator said it could. Quite a safety buffer. On a normal road, we definitely have reached a filling station, even after it said zero. Zu 20 Tankstellen geschafft im Notfall. Hätte ich nicht gedacht, dass noch so viel drin ist. So even after a substantial sample drive, the range indicator isn't that exact. Der Sensor hat natürlich schon Schwierigkeiten. According to our engine specialist, engineer Bent Lenzen, when the fuel level is very low, the fuel sloshes back and forth as the car moves. As a result, the indicator sensors has trouble gauging how much is left. Next, we test the BMW 5 Series. It too keeps on running after the range indicator says zero, even farther than the Golf. Oh, yes, is a the driver is provided with news and suggestions. Continue cautiously. Full power, not available. Have your service partner check the engine. The BMW has driven 26 kilometers farther than it promised. 26 kilometer weiter gefahren als vorausgesagt. Here too, the indicator was inaccurate, but to the driver's advantage. Don't worry about the service partner. Today, there's no hazard in driving a car till it's empty. Hartmut Goda from the ADAC Automobile Association says a modern vehicle with an empty tank can be refueled and restarted with no problem. Older diesel models sometimes had to be vented by hand, and some drivers may not have been able to do that properly. And we prove it. Refueled, the BMW starts with no fuss. So now it's the Hyundai's turn. Its range indicator is a little different. When the range goes below 50 kilometers, the indicator shows only dashes. How many kilometers are still possible? The Hyundai is already 13.1 kilometers farther than predicted. Daniel steps on the gas, but in vain. There's no more power. So all three range indicators we tested were inaccurate, but left some leeway for the driver. And that's better than the reverse.
Manufacturers don't want a reputation for leaving drivers high and dry, remarks our automotive engineer. So they design range indicators to stay on the safe side. In a pinch, you can drive a few kilometers farther than your range indicator says. How much farther varies from car to car. In that situation, try to save fuel. And the man from the Automobile Association gives some tips on how to do that. First, shut off all unneeded electric accessories. Then, drive with an eye to what's coming. And, shift to a higher gear as soon as possible. If the engine runs smoothly, driving at 50 kilometers an hour in the city, in fourth or fifth gear, is fuel conserving. But remember, if you do run out of gas, you'll have to walk. And you might even get a ticket. What is a mocha? A kind of coffee. It's like an espresso. It's Turkish. I've drunk mocha in Turkey. Opinion is divided. It's from Africa, Austria. And how is it best described? Strong and black. Small, strong and black. Not necessarily. But the opal mocha is available in brown and black for those who like it darker. The mocha is a new model from Opel, made in South Korea, explains Konstantin, although it was designed by Opel engineers back at German headquarters in Rüsselsheim. The mocha is a little longer than a Golf, but makes a far more muscular impression. And off-road, it is as tough as it looks, thanks to the big black protective panels. As for the interior, the rear bench is fixed, and you can't remove individual seats either, reports Constantine. Variability here is limited to folding down the two sections. The Mokka's compact dimensions suit it for city streets. The high seat position is a major reason for the popularity of cars like this, and that's certainly the case with Opel's smallest SUV to date. Plus, it comes with features previously associated with bigger cars. Safety systems like collision alert and traffic sign recognition, albeit at extra cost. We checked out the bigger of the two gasoline engines with 103 kilowatts of power. The manufacturer says that it consumes 6.3 liters of gasoline over 100 kilometers. Not the kind of car that gives you an immediate pep up. It could have done with an extra spoonful. If you want more power, you might want to plump for the diesel. The start-stop system is standard fitted. And there's no shortage of receptacles. Although also an excess of buttons and knobs. Typical Opel. Other models might not have a heated steering wheel, but their displays are generally a touch more sophisticated. We're in St. Peter Ording on the northwest German coast, where you're actually allowed to drive on the beach. If you're a fan of wet and wild conditions, you'll probably need to order the four-wheel drive edition, but that's only available in a higher-end equipment and engine package, costing just under 24,000 euros. The cheapest Mokka with front-wheel drive costs 19000 And how about the Mokka's towing credentials? Constantine borrowed the hitch from a farmer. It passes the test here. But don't overdo it. The clutch started to have a suspicious smell. And now to the big question. Why is the Mokka called the Mokka? Who better to ask than an Opel engineer? We were inspired by the coffee bean, small on the outside, but with a fantastic aroma and strength that unfolds when served, like our new model. This four-wheeled Mokka has its attractions, but may not be everyone's cup of coffee.
car tester Torsten Link has arranged to meet Jürgen Henrichs, a fan of the old Lloyd cars. That's the German Lloyds marquee from Bremen. They were supposed to meet at the workshop. This looks more like a shoe repair shop. Maybe someone mixed this place up with a maker of Lloyd shoes. They definitely don't repair cars here. There is a Lloyd shoe brand, but does it have anything to do with the cars? After all, the shoes were likewise made in Bremen, and both the cars and the footwear were originally made of wood. But the parallels are purely coincidental, as is the fact that Jürgen Henrik's car has a color scheme that might look better as a pair of Lloyd shoes. Neither the shoes nor the cars were truly waterproof when exiting the factory. It's always a good idea to take both shoes and cars for a test run before buying. Driving a Lloyd used to be considered a death-defying deed, as was its sister model, the Goliath, as Jürgen points out. He found this beauty in the southwest German state of Saarland, but the engine was shot. He found a new engine in the Lübeck area and put it in right away. Then he drove it home on its own power. He still got the old engine. But the long drive wasn't without its mishaps. An axle boot tore and leaked transmission fluid most of the way. It's almost impossible to find parts for a Lloyd on the spur of the moment. The little Arabella is often blamed for ruining not only the Lloyd make, but the entire Borgward group. Every car sold in the 1960s was said to have been a loss for its maker, despite its economy price tag. Its fault-strewn reputation lives to the present day. Torsen remembers that the Arabella's notorious leakiness earned it the nickname Aquabella. That was one of the car's design bugs. It wasn't easy to find out where the water was coming in. By trade, Jürgen Henrichs is an engineer for nuclear power plants. But with Germany phasing out nuclear power, he's got to find new things to do. One idea was to produce Lloyd parts, since hardly anyone else does. And now he's thinking of rebuilding the entire Lloyd plant. First, he had to acquire the rights to the the Lloyd brand. Now he's waiting for the go-ahead from investors to start construction in the Ruhr Valley. Jürgen bought up the rights for a paltry sum. Now, at retirement age, he's got plans to become a car maker. He turned to the renowned Folkwang Institute in Essen for help. Industrial designers turned his ideas into a concept for a modern Arabella. The results are impressive. But what matters is what's under the hood. So far, Jürgen has a 1.8-liter version, but other sizes are planned, and even one with electric drive. The electric version is to have a range of some 500 kilometers. This sounds like something big, a new make of car from Germany. Torsten wants to hear the whole story. Jürgen tells it to him on a long walk. For four years, Hendricks put almost everything he had into getting production of his new Lloyd up and running, but he couldn't find any investors who believed in the project. So he had to be content with keeping the old Arabella alive. Some people are surprised it runs at all. Torsten notices the fuel tank appears to be empty. Aha, because the gauge doesn't work. So what about the heating? Apparently that does work, it's just turned off. Because the heat exchanger is on the blink. Some other Lloyd drivers heard about our meeting and brought along their own babies. There's an Alexander. And an old 400 that was made with wood and imitation leather in the 1950s, like the shoe. But what do these connoisseurs think of Jürgen's prototype? Some say it's just a tad too modern. One fan says he needs his nostrils to be dark from the rust and dirt when he comes home on Saturday. Then all is well with his world. As for Jürgen Henriks, he's had enough of trying to keep his Arabella in good working order. He just doesn't have the time, so he's decided to part with it. But he's not quite ready to part with the rights to the Lloyd name. Maybe someday we'll see a new Lloyd made in the Ruhr after all. We wish him lots of luck.